Matthew Perry, the beloved actor from Friends, suffered from numerous physical and psychological health conditions. And he was not silent about his treatments. He recognized that you can't treat physical pain and physical suffering without addressing emotional pain and emotional suffering. You can't treat one without treating the other. And he was a vocal advocate for helping others find treatment for addiction, depression, and the other conditions that he was also suffering from. He was an advocate for so many and inspired us to not let this silent suffering continue. The stigma around treating our mental health has to end. And unfortunately, his death a couple months ago, we recently learned from the medical examiner in LA County that it was actually due to the treatment he was trying to use to heal his emotional suffering. We believe it was from a combination of ketamine, buprenorphine, coronary artery disease, and a pool where he was found dead, supposedly, uh, we believe, from drowning. I want you to learn what happened with the ketamine that he had been receiving from, no, from multiple different doctors and how it got paired with buprenorphine to ultimately lead to him not finding the healing that he wanted, but rather the opposite, and how you can protect yourself and learn what to look for if you or a loved one is also suffering from treatment-resistant depression or addiction, anxiety, or PTSD, if ketamine is right for you to ultimately help better advocate for yourself. I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And I have guided hundreds and hundreds of patients through ketamine infusions to help find transformative results and changes from what they've been suffering from for years or sometimes decades. And I want to answer a couple of important questions that you have about ketamine. We'll leave them to the end though, because first you need to understand that ketamine is a clear and colorless medication like this, first developed for use in operating rooms like the one I'm in right now. This was originally used as an anesthetic agent for surgery. It was later found that at low doses, at very low doses, ketamine can address what's called cognitive rigidity or feeling stuck. Patients come to me feeling incredibly stuck and painfully stuck. We have labels that we call along the spectrum of stuckness, whether it's depression, anxiety, addiction, et cetera. But we have to recognize that whether they are ruminative or perseverative loops of thought that we're stuck in, in the past we call those depression, of the future we call it anxiety, or if it's addiction where literally being triggered by something like a shot of whiskey in an alcoholic literally forces them to go through this loop of taking a shot of whiskey, they're stuck in a loop. Ketamine can break these loops. Biochemically, we call it neuroplasticity. And in that temporary relief from these loops can allow us to make long lasting changes by addressing the root causes of why we're stuck. That temporary relief can allow for long-term changes if ketamine is being used properly, responsibly, ethically. It can come in multiple different forms. And Matthew Perry was found to be taking we believe, multiple forms. And this is part of what led to his death, we believe. He was receiving ketamine infusions. So that's the first and most potent way of getting ketamine. You literally get a bag of salt water like this one here, and you connect it through tubing like this here into an IV, and you infuse the ketamine so it directly reaches your brain. You can also give ketamine through a shot, like what I'm holding here actually with a very small needle, very, very fine needle. Sorry, trigger warning if I don't want anyone to be upset with me here. This very, very th fine 30 gauge needle can be used to inject ketamine or a 27 gauge, 25 gauge, et cetera. Or you can have a nasal spray or you can take it orally. What's very important is that Matthew Perry, you believe, was taking two different forms of ketamine. And this is very important to understand the interaction with buprenorphine, which is an opioid agonist that is believed to, well, is used for opioid use disorder. And we believe he was using for his addiction as well. But the main side effects of ketamine, you need to know, are both up and down. So we call it an upper and downer, like other types of psychedelic substances. The upper part is because it increases, in the case of ketamine, your heart rate, your blood pressure. Your breathing rate typically stays the same. So unlike opioids, there isn't a profound respiratory depression. But 
The downer part comes in your brain where there is a sedative effect, where you're becoming, depending on the dose, anywhere from being disinhibited, having a hallucinogenic or almost a psychedelic-like experience to find healing, to full-on anesthesia and unconsciousness like we do in the operating room here. But Matthew Perry's last ketamine infusion appeared to be over a week before he was found dead. Yet there was ketamine in his system based on toxicology. We believe that perhaps he was receiving another form of ketamine that he more recently took, possibly a compounded oral form of ketamine, either sublingual, meaning it goes under your tongue, or it gets absorbed more rapidly. There's a higher bioavailability of sublingual ketamine versus just swallowing a pill. And that was likely in his system at the time that he died. He probably took that as a bridge or maintenance between his IV infusions. Now, I see Renee is saying in a hot tub, is that safe? Absolutely not, especially when there's buprenorphine also being mixed in here. So this is what you need to understand is that he had multiple things in the wrong direction at the wrong time. And this is exactly the opposite way of how ketamine should ever be used for addressing the root causes of our suffering. The upper effects, increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure. In somebody with coronary artery disease, these can increase the risk of heart attack and stroke. It's why when patients come to me for a ketamine infusion, we monitor very carefully with blood pressure monitors, heart rate monitors, maybe an EKG, depends on the patient, with expert doctors to make sure that they are safe, that the upper effects don't cause problems. But Matthew Perry, as I said earlier, had coronary artery disease, meaning the blood vessels around his heart were narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. That is a setup for a heart attack or a lethal arrhythmia. If you give ketamine to a heart that cannot handle the increase in heart rate, you can trigger an arrhythmia, maybe a heart attack. Now, I also mentioned the downer effects, the sedative effects. If you add an opioid agonist like buprenorphine, which by the way, is one of the two components of Suboxone, for those of you outside the United States, Suboxone is buprenorphine plus naloxone. The naloxone is included as a deterrent, but regardless, the buprenorphine, like any other opioid at a high enough dose, can cause sedation. So you have ketamine that, when added with a sedative, another sedative, I should say, can synergistically cause excess sedation. So you might have you know, the risk of heart attacks, then you have the risk of sedation, and you're in a body of water, like Renee said. Whether it was an arrhythmia, or whether it was sedation, or whether it was both of them put together, because if you're overly sedated and you don't have enough oxygen, you can also cause a heart attack, which if you have ketamine on board can be exacerbated as well in this whole system. I don't know exactly what the order of operations was that led to him ultimately drowning. And I'm not making any light of this. This is a tragic story, but I want you to appreciate how any powerful medication needs to be used appropriately. As we say, the poison is in the dose and the wisdom or the lack thereof in using it. Now, for those of you who are looking to heal from ketamine, I have a couple of very important tips that you need to know if you're trying to find healing from treatment-resistant depression, anxiety, PTSD, or other conditions. Uh, I do want you to know as well that I have a private live Zoom that we have a couple times a month. You can sign up for that in the link below because I can't answer all your questions here. I will do my very best. We're actually meeting this Sunday, and that's Medical Secrets Exclusive Access that you can sign up for. I also have a clinic in San Francisco where we responsibly use ketamine. And I always want any patient who's ever looking at ketamine to know these. It doesn't matter if you're in San Francisco or not. You need to make sure that you know the root of administration of ketamine that you're getting. Mixing these up the way that Matthew Perry apparently did, because he must have had ketamine more recently in his system because the ketamine from the infusion had long metabolized. And if he's found with it in his system, something had entered, we believe, orally. You need to know the root of administration. Who is administering it? How is the ketamine being used for the long-term improvements in mental health, not just a short Band-Aid fix? It is no good if we replace antidepressants, benzodiazepines, or other drugs, alcohol, cocaine, whatever, with ketamine. That is not good medicine. That is not what you deserve if you're struggling to heal like Matt Perry was. The goal is to help use ketamine to address root causes to come off of those other substances if safely possible. 
I'd really hope that if it is a cocaine or alcoholic that they are able to come off of it all together. But if it's an antidepressant, for example, maybe there's a role for it, maybe at a lower dose to reduce the risk of its side effects. But you cannot just be popping pills and walking into a pool with ketamine instead of taking the antidepressants you were earlier. That's not the purpose of using a powerful medication like ketamine. And once again, I'm not making any light of Matthew Perry's death, but this happens all too often where patients are silently suffering and they might be taken advantage of by mail order programs that make it seem like ketamine is a panacea to solve all of your problems. Folks, if you're listening, you have a sacred power over yourself that no one else in this universe has to help open up self-compassion for your own healing. Ketamine can help with that, but ketamine will not solve it. You have more power to solve that than anyone else. And I can never, for any patient, open up their door to self-compassion. I can simply facilitate it. Because once that door to self-compassion opens, you have a sustainable relief, potentially from anything along that spectrum that I said, whether it's depression and anxiety, PTSD, or addiction. The cognitive rigidity that we can address with ketamine to induce flexibility, you can have a long-lasting benefit with when used in a responsible and compassionate and caring setting. Unlike any other medication, ketamine, you can't just pop the pill and expect to be better because your mindset ahead of time determines where it takes you. Just like any other anesthetic that we use in operating rooms like this, your mindset determines where the medication will take you and how it will affect you and for how long. I want you to know that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. Please, let's use Matt Perry's legacy as a reminder that we do have this power and that we should advocate for others who are suffering so that they don't, so that, pardon, they don't need to suffer silently. The stigma of mental health is kind of ridiculous because mental health and physical health are one and the same. Matt Perry knew it. He was trying to fix one to heal the other. While he didn't make it, let's hope that you and your loved ones can learn from this. So if you do appreciate me coming on here, please hit that like button, share with others to help advocate for your health and for their health. And I want to answer some of your questions now. K-holing is a really fascinating topic, Heidi. Thank you for bringing that up. When ketamine is used at the wrong dose, it can disassociate somebody from their body, meaning that they are not feeling like they're in their body. Yet they're also not fully asleep and unconscious like they would be under anesthesia. They're stuck in this space where they feel like they are not connected to their body and they may never be able to return to their body. So K-hole is like literally falling in that hole. It's described in recreational use where clearly, clearly the dose is not being monitored by anyone. In my clinic, I've never had anyone fall into a K-hole because we are monitoring. And if we approach a K-hole, we reorient, we change the dose, we have many tools to help find that sweet spot. And if you're looking for a ketamine clinic, you need to be asking, who are the doctors? How are they monitoring to prevent that risk from happening? How are they helping establish long-term sustained relief from the ketamine, not just a quick fix? These are what I want you to have the confidence to ask so that you find the right healer for you. Combat medics use Ketamine in Vietnam, yes, Ringo, you're absolutely correct, and we still use it today. How do I feel about TMS treatment? TMS is powerful, transcranial magnetic stimulation, literally putting giant magnets outside your skull to turn on circuits in your brain that can help promote healing from treatment-resistant depression. Uh, it's kind of like a cousin of electroconvulsive therapy. TMS is very expensive, uh, not a ton of data on it, but data certainly looks promising. And I have patients that are doing ketamine while receiving TMS if the ketamine alone does not cut it. Or patients that come from TMS and add ketamine to it if the TMS alone is not cutting it. I will say that it's interesting that ketamine alone is so incredibly effective without some of the side effects or cost of TMS. And I wonder if it's not more valuable for patients to begin with ketamine before exploring these other transcranial modalities like ECT or TMS. Good question. Special K versus ketamine, Nicholas, they refer to the same thing, but special K is typically what they call it illegally uh, for recreational use, which I do not condone at all. This is a dangerous medication if not used properly for the reasons we're talking about here. Do I use ketamine for RSI? Yes, kidmetic, ketamine can be used for RSI. Very good question. How did he drain, drown? People are saying not ketamine, the heart, how? Well, you can see that these are all connected. 
When we are overly sedated, we can precipitate a heart attack. Whether the buprenorphine did it alone, unlikely because ketamine is a downer, buprenorphine is a downer, boom, you can cause sedation. Or the upper effects of ketamine to also cause a heart attack. Not a good combination, clearly. Is it, is it in any way possible that ketamine remains longer in the body if you have heart issues? Mama Lina, very good question. Ketamine can remain longer in the body if your kidneys cannot metabolize it, which is why when patients come to me, for higher dose ketamine infusions, such as for complex regional pain syndrome, I need to know what their kidney function is. So I need a basic metabolic panel or a creatinine level at the very least to make sure that they are metabolizing ketamine correctly to make sure the dose does not stay elevated for longer than necessary. So heart issues alone would not likely do that because the kidney function will determine how long it stays in the body. Very good question. Ketamine causes near-death experience. Well, it certainly can if it's overdosed. It might cause a full death experience as well. Uh, good question, Don. Russian Aloha. I, I like your username. I'm glad you're talking about awareness. This shouldn't sway people away from ketamine. There's many positives. Absolutely. Once again, whether it's a parent, for example, and a child, how many positive parent-child relationships are there? How many detrimental parent-child relationships are there? In my patient population, more than half of patients with PTSD come to me from a childhood trauma involving parents. How about opioids? The opioid pendulum has swung far too, uh, far too much in the other direction where patients who need opioids for chronic pain cannot receive them. Of course, there's huge dangers to opioids. How about propofol that we use here in the operating room? You can swing in the direction of Michael Jackson or it can be used ethically and safely for effective anesthesia for surgery. So ketamine or anything, look at artificial intelligence, another example, et cetera, the poison is in the dose. The poison is in the dose and the wisdom or the lack thereof surrounding. People who need pain management are treated like drug addicts. That's, of course, very wrong, Sherry. I hate that. I agree. It's why I don't ask for pain meds. I've been reduced to using alcohol to manage my pain. Well, Sherry, I'm so sorry to hear that you've been labeled like that. I hope that you come out with information from these videos to better advocate for yourself. I have a whole video on the opioid pendulum and what you can do to advocate for yourself when speaking with a doctor. Last question, can fentanyl be given with ketamine in the OR or are there contraindications? You absolutely can give both of them. I give them regularly, but it's important to recognize that the anti-pain effects of ketamine often reduce the need for fentanyl in operating rooms like this one, but it depends on the surgery depends on the individual's past medical history, but they are both powerful when used at the right time. They're both natural. Ketamine has actually been discovered naturally produced in certain fungal species. Op uh, fentanyl is a synthetic version of opioids, which absolutely are natural from the unripe opium poppy, uh, from the unripe poppy seed, pardon. So the interesting both from the natural world, both have powerful uses, both can be dangerous when used incorrectly. So thank you all for coming on here. Please hit that like button. If you learned something new, share what you learned with others to help others advocate for their health. And remember that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. If you want to access our private live streams over Zoom, you can hit that um, link below to sign up for our exclusive access. And remember to subscribe to keep up with all of our live streams. Until next time.